to uh, our next edition of Conversations That Matter. Um, Conversations That Matter is a show that um, we talk about race, diversity, inclusion, and social justice. And we're happy to be here today in a special edition in a series um, during Women's History Month. And today we will be talking with a panel of authors and um, people uh, who are in the literary world in our show entitled Women Who Make a Difference in Literature. So welcome today, everybody. I'm glad to see you. I'm glad to see some of our repeat um, guests. Um, and, uh, and we are going to go right into it because this is going to be really, really good. I'm waiting to see if I see our last and final um, panelist, and that's what I am waiting for. So I'm just going to go right into it. So today we have five um, panelists. I'm so excited about that. I wanted to take you through um, the world of, uh, of book writing and literary. So I wanted to take you through the world of publishing all the way to um, getting that book into the store. You know, what goes into that process? And I see Yolanda here. So today I have with me Yolanda Lewis. I have with me um, Vicki Titcom. I have Deborah Tao O'Brien. And I have Becky Field and Ayana Parent. And I'm grateful to you all for being with us today. Today, I'm going to start with Yolanda Lewis. Yolanda, can you um, unmute yourself? There you are. Mm -hmm. Here I am. Hey, everyone. Hey. Yeah. So hey, gonna, Yolanda. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to introduce Yolanda th this morning. Yolanda Lewis. She oh, is, um, let me see, she has s several wonderful titles, um, the internet intentional entre, uh, let me see, intentional authorpreneur. I love right. that, mm -hmm. right? Um, you take authors from invisible to visible, mm -hmm. right? Um, you say that you don't need anyone's permission to write and tell your story, right? That's right. Um, mm -hmm. She's a six time best selling author. She has written 10 books, most recently a children's book she um, is a songwriter and hopefully at the end <laughs> of the show, you'll hear her song. I'm just so excited about that. She's written a song and she also has, um, has a music video to go with it. So it's just amazing. Um, she's a speaker, she's a coach. She has an MBA in business and um, she's transitioned into the world of publishing. She has a, a, a company called Extreme um, Overflow Publishing. And I think she has 30 titles under her, her, her label, let's say, um, at least, right? Mm -hmm. And she transitioned into the world of, of, of publishing after being laid off in the corporate world. And thank God that you did because you lend so much to people. Um, I wanted you to talk about um, some of the services that you offer. I, I noticed that you, in your um, publishing company, you go from coaching that writer into writing, um, editing that book, um, uh, marketing and branding, that whole process. And that's yes. very helpful mm -hmm. uh, to writers. Um, it said that 89% of writers think they can make a living at writing, but only 69% 69, 69 of those people get discouraged in the mm -hmm. process. And that's yeah. where, where you come in when you prepare them mm -hmm. for the work, um, mm -hmm. then they're good. So Yolanda. Yes, thank you so much, Marie, first. Thank mm -hmm. you for having me. I'm excited to be a part of your 
um, event. You are always empowering women and I love to be a part of that space. So thank you so much for having me. And hello to all the beautiful women and fellow authors on the panel. Uh, it is my pleasure to meet you all. Some of you I know um, and have hugged a time or two before, um, but I'm so glad to meet you all. But, you know, I believe writing is a journey. Um, I believe that writing is a journey that you are not just telling a story, but you're living that story. So even in all the things that I've done, what I tell my authors and what I encourage my authors to do and to be and to have and to go for, I'm living myself. So um, I'll, I'm gonna take a step back just a moment to share with you um, how I got started into publishing. So my first book, and, and there's been some updates since um, some of the accolades that uh, Marie uh, read off. But first, um, you know, when I first got started in publishing my first book, I didn't know what I was doing. I just wanted to get my story out. That was important to me. I wanted to help someone else not be stuck in the cloud of the past um, because that was something that I had personally experienced. And so I wanted to help them get from behind there, even if I'm just the first step. Um, I didn't seek to write an end all be all kind of uh, story. I wanted to do that. Well, by I wrote my second, so that book did well. Uh, that was my first bestseller. Then the second book flopped, <laughs> um, but I still was pressed about, you know, sharing my message. I didn't give up per se. Well, I was approached by a publishing company and just to be honest, something about the deal just didn't feel right. Couldn't put my finger on it. The numbers look fine, all that other good stuff, but it just, it didn't feel right inside of me. So I declined the offer. Well, don't you know, after I declined the offer, they proceeded to tell me, well, you're not that good of a writer anyways. No one will ever read your books, you know, all this kind of negative talk. And so as a new author, I was so incredibly discouraged um, because I just wanted to share my little piece of story. <laughs> I wasn't looking to be a best selling anything. I just wanted to help someone. And so after healing and some just real self reflection, I decided, you know what, I want to be the space that authors can come to, to figure out what they don't know, right? You don't know what you don't know when you enter the author game or say, I wanna be an author. You have no clue, you just have a story. Well, I want to be the space that doesn't handle people like that, um, but be the space where you could ask questions, be the space where you could grow, not just with your book and I help you pump that out, but actually grow into whatever your message is, into whatever your offering is. So with that being said, the way our publishing company is set up, it's a little different than your average run of mill publisher because we go from the beginning of the process and so if you have no words on the paper you just you know you have a story to tell we help you from that starting point or if you're already published we don't have to have published you and we've had 50 plus titles now so uh, we're, we're on the move helping lots of authors but even if you already have a book and you have not published with us we can help you get from that place to actually going from pen that's what I call it, from pen to profit. And so you're going from um, invisible to um, visible and simply irresistible. That's what I like to say with it, making you irresistible to your audience so they cannot not say yes to whatever it is that you're offering. And there's a way to go about that. There's a process, there's a methodology that I teach my authors through what I call the boss, uh, Author Boss Academy as the intentional entrepreneur. So I wanted to just give a little bit of that backstory because I think it's important for other writers to know, nobody, I have all these accolades, but it was a process <laughs> to getting to where I am today. And I'm still growing in many, many ways. So I hope that was encouraging and answered your question in a very long way, Marie. Yeah, that was amazing. Um, yeah, some of her titles are Wife, Pray, Win, Reverse mm -hmm. the Curse, Love your beautiful and most recently, Ominera, and that means freedom, right? Yes. And yes. and that's yes. her children's book, and it comes with the most amazing song. And I'm I'm so proud of you. And one Thank of the you. things that um you you are one of the most inspirational speakers um, that you. I've seen. You you've spoken several times at Driven, and um I think you have one of the most packed rooms. Uh, there and, and women walk away inspired and encouraged and you have published some books from mm -hmm. from from those uh people so we're going to come back to you and thank okay, you um so much for uh being with us today 
And Ayana, we're going to call on you next. Ayana Parent. And Ayana is a mother, daughter, sister, wife. And she is a pound pro, a life coach. Um, she is uh, my friend. She is a survivor, right? Um, and she uh, is fierce. Um, that, that's all I can say. I've known um, Ayana for about seven years now, also um, part of the Driven Woman Conference. When I first um, said I want to put on a conference for women, I was in a room with about 20 women. And I remember succinctly that Ayana stood up like this with a little hand and said, I'll help you. You know, and she did. And she was with me every step of the way. And this is her book here, Becoming Free. And I picked up this book a few days ago, and um, I've been wanting to read a book. If you're a mom, a busy woman, a businesswoman, you know that reading is at a premium. You don't have much time. And during this pandemic, I hope that you all have had a little more time to read. And it was such a fascinating read. Um, and I, I feel like I became free with reading that. So um, again, I just want you, yeah, I want you <laughs> um, in your own words. And then I, I have a few, you know, points to questions to ask you, but to, to give the audience the substance of your book and what you want people to come away with by reading sure. your book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I hope you guys can hear me. I'm in my studio and it's really echoey, but um. So yeah, I'm Ayanna Parent. I'm the owner and founder of um, Be Free Coaching and Wellness. Um, and uh, our mission is to really help change and transform people's lives through movement, my, movement mindfulness, and fun. Um, but that's sort of the end, of, not the end, but it's sort of where I am now. Um, and so that people that just meet me are like, oh my God, you're so incredible. You've built this whole studio and isn't this so great? And um, while it is so great, um, it was really a journey to get here. So it wasn't it was not smooth in terms of my own personal journey. Um, so the book sort of, sort of goes back and outlines how um, me, myself as a young child really, I dealt with a lot of trauma in my life um, and have come out sort of on the better side of healing. And, um, you know, for me, I'm certainly a person in recovery from alcohol addiction, proud to be it because I wouldn't have had this studio if I wasn't sober, let me just tell you that. <laughs> um, so it sort of outlines um, how childhood trauma can um, really A, affect you, but then um, B, sort of just all the things that you think about yourself and the world really get tainted with sort of a negative um, way of being. And so that's where sort of the alcohol piece came in. And for other people, it could be food, other people it could be cigarettes, you know, there's all kinds of things, the computer. Um, so the book really sort of outlines how that journey really affected me and I used alcohol to cope. And then I really found movement and mindfulness and breath and yoga to really change that dynamic and actually get to know myself and really love who I am. And um, then from the mat, really creating this business model that, that um, is behind me now. Yeah, and I remember when she said uh, at the conference, um, we got snowed in, um, the night of the first conference. And I remember it, you know, waking up the next day, we were snowed in, we all hopped into bed together. And I remember her talking with a fellow yogi or health and wellness person about this concept of a wellness center and her dreaming. And to me, not being a yogi or a wellness center person, um, you know, you kind of listen to someone's dreams and you go, wow, that sounds, um, big you know like maybe it's an undoable or I can't really fathom that now I I stepped in the door of the ribbon cutting of the wellness center and I see with my own eyes the manifestation of her dream still not knowing all that was contained in this book <laughs> and the trauma that she lived with in her quest to overcome all that she's come. So stories are powerful, you know, and we all have a story within us. And that's the beauty of, of literature in the writing, you know, that, that we have stories to tell. 
And in, oh, we're going to get into it, guys. So let me just introduce our next guest. And, okay. and I, I love you. this. I love this one. And we'll come back to you, Anna. Um, yeah, the next no one is um, we're going to introduce Becky Fields. And Becky is a documentary photographer. And she is in New Hampshire. Um, she was recommended to me by someone who watched this show. And that's the power of the show. The show is now being shared. And Yolanda, you said this on when you first came on my show. You said, Marie, this is going to be big. This is going to go somewhere. It's not like Oprah or anything, but I feel like it is. Um, anyway, it's on different cable TV stations and it gets taped and it gets shared out. But someone from New Hampshire saw it. And now I'm going to be on her event and um, Becky is going to be the, the speaker on that event as well. So anywho, um, I love your work, Becky. And I, I really didn't grasp what a documentary photography, you know, is. And she has a couple of books out. And one is called um, Finding Home Portraits and Memoirs of Immigrants. And the other one is called Different Roots, Common Dreams, right? And um, New Hampshire's cultural diversity. And she documents immigrants, particularly in New Hampshire, right? Um, immigrants, not only who come there through, you know, circumstance of fleeing from their homelands, but also people who come to the state for love or, or moving there for other reasons. Um, she, she's gonna tell you about the things that she does because I think she does it more justice by telling you, but I'm just so pleased to have um, met you. We, we've spoken and I get to see some of your beautiful work. And I just think it's so timely right now because we have um, an influx right now of thousands of, of immigrants who are flocking mainly children to our Southern borders, right? We have families who are coming and they're being stopped because of the pandemic, but children are being let in alone. And, um, and we're not seeing the full gravity of that in pictures or on the news because it's not time, but in time we will see more of that, but um, there's stories to be told. So Becky, can you share with us um, a little of your background? You have a great background. Um, she has a background as a research scientist, right? And she's merging the two um, fields. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Becky. Well, thanks, Marie. It's a real pleasure to be here. And, and I'm just really honored to be part of this uh, impressive panel. So um, yes, I'm in Concord, New Hampshire. And my uh, primary career in my life has been a wildlife research ecologist with the federal government and a university professor. But in the last 10 years, I have switched over to photography and had just an amazing experience with this. I'm photographing exclusively immigrants and refugees in New Hampshire, which is a state that is rather famously low in diversity in all sorts of ways. And, um, uh, and yet, I have found such richness and such beautiful uh, people that contribute to our communities through my photography. So as a photographer, um, I'm really into images rather than words, although I do love to talk. So uh, bear with me while I share my screen and let's see if, if we can get this to work. So does that look good to everybody? Yeah. Here it comes. Okay, so my project, my overall project is called Different Roots common dreams and today my subtitle is a photographer's view of cultural diversity. This is a Burundi bride who was um, uh, her, she was getting married in a, a Muslim ceremony and I was very fortunate to be able to photograph her. So I've been able to photograph people doing all kinds of things, uh, just basically documenting their lives. And some of them are, are people taking care of their children or cooking at home or working to support their families. And they've been so wonderful and welcoming to me to come into their lives and come into their communities. And so I've, um, I've been able to collect over the last um, literally 10 years of, of, of different aspects of immigration life in New Hampshire. So I'm gonna rather quickly show you just a few slides of some of the images that I've taken. 
uh, first of all, this is what I would call one of uh, the faces of immigration. I very often will photograph uh, people's faces just to show the beauty and the diversity and the colors of people from other countries that have resettled in New Hampshire. I photograph families, uh, friends that are together, um, and very often these families will invite me back multiple times as this Somali ha family has done over the years. I've been back for weddings, for, for um, celebrations, graduations, uh, and uh, sometimes senior proms, and sometimes just the family hanging out together, maybe with a new baby, or, uh, they invite, or they'll invite me in to enjoy a meal. Children, I love to photograph children. So I have many in my collection of children from different countries and the exuberance and the joy that they, uh, they show in their lives. And they love being photographed. Um, also people um, always want to work to support their families. And there are many different ways in which the people that come here from different countries uh, support their families. Some of them working in the fields as this um, Congolese woman was doing in Canterbury, New Hampshire. Um, other people are, are working in the food industries because we all love food from different countries. And it's certainly something people know how to cook. So it's good for all of us. Um, often people come here with very high degrees and it's a real challenge for them to be able to work in some of those fields because they need to take uh, refresher courses, courses or exams or, or whatever. But um, it's very important for us to be able to help them to do that so that we benefit and that they are able to support their families. Uh, hang on a second. Um, oh dear. Okay, it looks, it looks like my um, mouse um, battery has died. So wouldn't you know. So anyway, I guess I'm going to um, need to stop share. Whoops, there we go. Thank you. All right, um, sorry about that. But anyway, um, um, so then, then also that I was gonna show you some pictures of people uh, working to support their families and also people practicing their faith. And uh, that's very important. There are two books that I have um, uh, published. Um, one is, the first one was called uh, Different Roots, Common Dreams, as Marie mentioned. This is predominantly photographs and it's uh, photographs of people uh, doing all different kinds of aspects of their life, you know, loving their children as in this case. And then at the end, I added a few photograph, a few um, essays by immigrants of their experiences of coming to this country. And that inspired me to do my second book, um, which as Marie mentioned is called Finding Homes, Port Portraits and Memories of uh, uh, New Hampshire Immigrants. And so um, uh, this book was really pretty exciting for me. And it, it, of course, it came out in the middle of a pandemic, which added to the excitement. But what I did with this was to um, not only do the photographs, but also to interview people and have them share their stories. This is a story of a man from Ghana who came here for an internship and he worked in a hydroponic farm and has taken his skills back to Ghana where he's hoping to share that with, with folks. So um, I'm really pleased with this book because I, I, it, it's their stories. It's not me telling their stories. This is in the first person for their voice. And I recorded the stories and then transcribed them and you know, for length mostly. Some of these interviews went on for two hours. <clears throat> but then I sent them back to each of, the, each of the immigrants so that they could make any corrections and make sure that what I shared with them was true. So um, my, I'll put my website in the chat, but um, I'm very pleased with the, um, with the um, opportunity that I've had to be able to share the story about immigration uh, policies, refugee resettlements, and the uh, different ways in which we can um, uh, make sure that people are feeling welcome in our community. And that's, I think, absolutely essential. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna go get a battery for my mouse. Awesome. So you guys, please add your questions to the chat. Um, the Midwest, Midwest Book Review said of um, Becky's book that 
Finding Home Portraits and Memoirs of Immigration is an extraordinary contribution to our current and ongoing um, national dialogue over immigration. And I agree, you know, when we can see um, the faces and lives of other people at work and at home and at play, and when we can read their stories in their own words, those otherisms start to melt away and we see ourselves as each other, you know? And I think that goes a long way um, to the dialogue. So the next guest is Vicki Tickcom. Let me put my back. And you can unmute yourself, Vicki. Um, Vicki Titcom is the owner of Titcom's Bookshop right here in beautiful Sandwich, Massachusetts on Route 6A. Um, I just love, love, love the story of how the bookshop came to be. Um, I love that it's a family-owned business. Um, you know, after speaking to Vicki for five minutes and and just reaching out to her and then going on um, her Facebook page and site, I just had this real sense of Titcom's bookshop is so much more than a bookshop. It's community, am I right? It, it just encompasses community here. Um, you sell books, new and old, you sell toys and gifts. Um, you host events there. You have authors from all over, famous and and not so famous. I think you put probably put people on the map. Um, you have a, a, it's just so family, the story. Do you want to tell it or should I tell it? Can you, do you want to tell it? Um, That's all, Marie. Thank yeah. you I think so, it's so much. I think the story of your, it's just, um, I think it's um, like, I don't know. It just <laughs> happenstance. It's like so God inspired. Like it just kind of happened to your family. And then look what happened to your family. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, thanks, the legacy. Thanks, thanks for looking. Yeah. Thanks for looking at that. And um, first, I have to say thank you for inviting me. I'm in awe of being with these amazing women. I honor your book is selling like hotcakes at our store. So thank you so much for letting us sell it here. And it's wonderful. Um, so yeah, it, it, and since you bring it up, Marie, um, I, I would love to share this story because it is kind of a, a wonderful story. Um, I'm the oldest of eight children, but when there were just six of us, my dad got a job in Connecticut. He's an engineer and they could not find a house big enough that they could afford for all of us. So my dad bought a house sight unseen by my mom, who I think was pregnant at the time. And um, he bought it and it hadn't been lived in for 10 years. And then it was lived in by these 90 year old sisters, the Baldwin sisters. So it was a grand adventure. I was, um, I was in maybe seventh grade and we we're fixing up this house and it, um, it needed a lot of work and there were barns in the back. And we kids would go, we were exploring everywhere and we started coming in from the barn with papers. And there were things dating back to the 1700s, something signed by someone who signed the Declaration of Independence, um, ma old maps, we sold some railroad timetables. This is what, one of the reasons I love book selling and there are many, but the first thing we sold uh, were some railroad timetables and we bought a St. Bernard puppy and then we sold something else and bought a pregnant pony. So, um, so we thought this was really quite wonderful. We did move. Um, my dad was transferred to the Cape in 1969, and they found uh, this house where um, we, where the bookshop is now. Um, and we've been there ever since. So it's been a little over 50 years, and the shop has grown. Uh, we started just with used and rare books. But I came back, um, I'd been working in museums beforehand and then came back in 91 um, when my brothers built an addition to my parents' house. We had the old bookstore was in a little um, uh, carport. Uh, we had to cover stuff with tarps when it rained because <laughs> the roof leaked. But um, so they built this beautiful barn structure, did all the work. Uh, my brother, Ted, and my brother, Paul, 
And my brother Ted also made the statue that's out front. It's a life-size statue of a colonial man that many people recognize along Route 6A. He did that as a high school project. Um, so we have been very much a family-oriented business. Um, my grandmother worked in the store till she was 90. And my mom still works in the store. And I won't say how old she is because she'll kill me. But <laughs> so uh, she buys our cards. Um, but we thank you for mentioning community. We are so grateful. We're incredibly grateful to the people in our community um, for supporting us. And we try to meet their needs as much as we can. Uh, we, um, we, got in, we started buying more and more new books when I came back to the store. And um, now we're primarily new books. We do still love, treasure the old books um, and toys, wonderful toys and gifts as well. Um, we host authors, as you said, and, um, and we try our best to uh, present the type of books that uh, we feel are worthy and also um, that our customers are looking for. And um, so I think that's basically us. Um, yeah. And Steve you. Fisher at the New England Independent Booksellers Association said that Ticcom Bookshop has embodied everything that is good and, and uh, about independent bookstore. Steve. He, yeah. He said you're dedicated <laughs> to provide um, expertise and passion and individual service to your customers. So I think you're doing a little more than, than um, what you're saying. So yeah, well, you're doing a great that's, job. That's yeah. nice of him. He gave yeah. us an awful lot of help as we were learning how to do what we're doing. As you said, we fell into this in a lot of ways. We happened to move in a place and that we had so much learning to do. And the best community, and I think everyone here in the panel would agree that the literary community is incredibly giving and supportive of each other. Um, and we want to encourage our local authors as well and have a program for that. So, so thank yeah, you. Yeah, I see some um, of our, you know, fellow writers on, on here um, on this call. So I'm glad that you're here and listening and I hope that you'll get some tips. And if there's other authors on, um, on the call, please put your books or links or websites in the chats as well. And please folks, put your questions for our panel in the chats um, so that we can have a, a good discussion after we um, int uh, introduce everyone. So our final panelist is my friend, my longtime friend, um, Deborah O'Brien. And she is up there. Deborah is a self-image consultant. She's an author. She's a speaker, a self-image consultant, an interior designer. Um, she guides others through meditation. Um, I, you know, Deborah, I don't know what to say about you. She, you know, she's just, <laughs> she's just a beautiful, elegant woman, you know, just a, a lovely, a lovely, lovely soul, right? Who has um, helped me with so many things. Her book is called Bliss. It was under my computer. Um, Bliss <laughs> Behind the Mask, right? And it said that um, when she was born, um, her aunt had said, she heard in a conversation that she was born with a mask on her face and that she almost killed her mother in childbirth. I think she overheard that in an adult conversation. And her book too is also about um, addiction, right? Something that I didn't know um, about Deborah as well. Just like I didn't know that about Ayana after knowing these two incredibly strong giving women, um, you know, I, I, I didn't know until I read their books. They're really powerful, life-changing books, you know? Um, my mother's on the call and my mother read Bliss Behind the Mask and, and she just loved it. My son, two different generations, two different genders, and they both just loved, love, love this book. So Deborah, um, you know, I wanted you to talk about your book, of course, give us a little substance about your book in your new upcoming book. She has a new book. Who writes a new book in the, in the middle of a pandemic? It's called The End of the Beginning. The End of the Beginning, right? It's fiction. And um, 
you know, I just wanted you to talk about the process, right? What, who writes a book? How do you get to that point where you say, I mean, you're a mother of five children, right? You, you're, you're a wife of an attorney. You were, you were once married to a golf pro, divorced. You had a life of substance abuse. You had, you know, a divorce. You had recovery. Um, you had a career in, you know, interior design. Then you sit down and say, I'm going to write this book. And the amount of discipline that it takes to write a book and then some years later, write another book. Where does that come from, Deborah? Oh, Marie, you, it's really not from me at all. This, I, I think it's just all uh, from God. You know, I just get this inspiration that I can't deny and uh, it takes over. <laughs> and, you know, uh, this pandemic just was like the opportunity for me to write this book because before I wanted to write another book, but I didn't have the time. So uh, when I had to hunker down, I knew right away, this is what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, with what was going on in the world, it was so depressing with uh, listening to the news on TV. And uh, there, there was just so much sadness. And I, I was kind of thinking maybe I'd call the new book Fear Behind the Mask, because everyone has this fear on their faces, you know, when when the pandemic came out, we didn't know what was happening. So um, I just decided I would get up in the morning and uh, write till noontime. So I would write from eight to 12. So that was, it was discipline. And um, it got so, I, lo I loved doing it so much. It was like something to do, but also um, it was like such entertainment. And I was having so much fun. I would be laughing and laughing all the time because where these ideas were coming from, I don't know, but I, they would just come out on the paper and I'd be like, oh my God, I don't believe I just wrote that. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. But I, my point of writing it was to help people. Uh, I think the trouble uh, that I was seeing, we were all becoming numb after a while, we weren't feeling anything. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it was due to um, principles and character and, uh, you know, just uh, old fashioned virtues just seem to be out of style. So, um, you know, I just thought, well, this will be a way to, uh, tell a story, but teach some lessons at the same time. So it was fun and I can't wait to be, for it to be finished. How close are you to finishing? Well, I'm in editing right now. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I probably will submit it in about two weeks. Oh, wow, I can't wait. Yeah. Can't wait. Something born out of the pandemic has to be good. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, I'm so uh, amazed with all these amazing women that are on your panel today. Uh, I just can't believe it. there's just so much wisdom out there and that you put this all together, Marie. You are such a connector. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that um, kind word. So we're going to open it up um, in a bit in a bit for some questions. So please get your questions ready, put them in the chats and I'll call on you. So um, there's a couple of things that I wanted to ask, um, particularly about this time during the pandemic and about book writing, book reading. And um, one thing I want to ask you, Ayana, um, in, in terms of your book and your book being about recovery, um, you know, in terms of alcoholic recovery, um, during the pandemic, a lot of us were, um, you know, isolated in our homes. And I know that um, addictions were at probably all time high in terms of, you know, food addiction, um, alcohol, you know, other substances. And were you in more of a demand? Were you, I know you, you've, you've created some platforms your Love and Revolution page in response to George Floyd killing. Um, 
and other things, but how about um, in terms of the substance abuse circle? Yeah, that was really tough, I think, in um, COVID just because it's so funny. I, I wrote a blog and I didn't publish it. It was right before COVID hit about what would we do if we couldn't, what would the recovery community do if they couldn't access AA meetings? And all of a sudden we couldn't access them, except for online. However, the, you know, the opposite of addiction is connection. Um, it's not necessarily not drinking. So it's really, that was, that was a really scary place to be for, for lots of people. And unfortunately what people didn't see is that I know a lot of people died from COVID, but the, the reports of the people that actually died from alcohol abuse or drug abuse was, was skyrocketing. I mean, it was, it was very high. I mean, the numbers will come out at some point. Um, so I think it just reinforced for me, it just, um, I recently went nonprofit and was like, people really, really need help. Cause what, what's lacking with the sort of AA community and, you know, again, anyone that got sober in there is fine. It's wonderful program. However, um, it, you know, people need tools in the moment. So like that 20 minutes where you're like triggered or you want to go drink or you want to go use, you know, you need some, those 20 minutes before you can get somebody on the phone and you can drive to a meeting. What are you going to do? Like, what's your toolbox look like? And that typically should really look like movement and mindfulness, because that's something you can access in your own body in any moment in time. Um, so it just sort of reinforced that, oh my gosh, this is needed more than ever. Great. Yeah. And Yolanda, um, likewise, have, do you see an uptick in people wanting to write um, their stories? I know you had in your, um, uh, let me see, what do you call it? Your art, uh, so intentional author, preneur space, yeah. you had a series going on, right? And mm -hmm. online, and it was exciting to watch. And I'm wondering, did you see an uptick of people wanting to write um, their stories? Most definitely, even if they didn't publish them, there was a huge need, if you will, or demand to actually express it. Um, and some of it came from the need to get out of your own head, you know, like Deborah was talking about the joy of writing a fiction book. You're in character, like you're not yourself. And so that's fun. <laughs> and with all that we went through um, last year and even up to the current, people were looking for some fun. But one of the things that I wanted to provide to authors in the Intentional Authorpreneur group, and if there are authors here, I definitely invite you to join. It's a free group on Facebook. Um, but I wanted to provide them tools because everybody was slowed down enough to really think about how they want to be an impact with the book, right? The excitement of you got the book out, I wrote my first book or second book or third book or eighth book is, is out and it's, it's closed, if you will. But now people can actually think about how do I want to help someone and get back to that help space. And so there's a certain way and methodology, again, that I teach in how you go about that. And so I shared those concepts in a training um, during that because I wanted to be a resource for authors who felt like I have this story. I don't know what to do with it, especially now. I don't know where to go because I can't go out and actually touch and reach people. But there's still hope, you know, there's still ways to connect. And for those, I saw a lot of um, a variety of um, age, you know, differences within those who wanted to share as well. And that's kind of where I went with my personal project where you're not too old, you're not too young to ever start something new. So giving yourself permission to say, you know what, I want to write a book. That's what I'm going to do with my time. Whether it's fiction, you come out of character, or whether it's your journey, you've been wanting to express and help someone, and then the next steps to get it out. So I did see an uptick, to answer your question more directly, I did see an uptick and I did my best to make sure that I was available to those who were looking for those type of resources on how do I get started? Where do I start? Where do you start writing your book? I've got all these ideas in my head. Where is step one? Um, and being that resource to help them get there. And those who had a book, where do I start now to still connect with people with what I have? So being able to be those starting points for those two folks um, was fun. And um, you know, I did my best to make sure that we were providing those resources. Mm -hmm. And Vicki, did you see an uptick in people? I know people needed something to do. I know um, in terms of my own family, we visited um, the Osterville Public Library, you know, a lot. Um, we um, 
you know, my son has Down syndrome, but we had so many people call and offer to read to him on Zoom. And we continue that now. My sister's on the call and she, um, you know, she's an attorney and she takes her time and she calls and reads animated stories to him. And a former friend who's a, a former, not a former friend, but a former librarian calls and reads <laughs> to him. And there's so much value. Like we, we had a conversation and we said words, you know, are powerful words have meaning. And um, did you find an uptick in people um, coming to your, um, I have two part question, coming to your store for, for books to read and in the wake of this movement of social change, have you found an uptick in people coming for books on black history and also um, books um, like how to be an anti-racist and things like that? Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you asked that because you're right, words have power. And I love, um, your program's amazing and your whole idea about conversations and the power of conversations. And books are there when you can't necessarily have a conversation too. And they really allow, I see Yolanda like nodding, yes. And I know the rest, it's a way of, um, uh, as for the reader, a way of stepping into someone else's shoes and looking at the world through their eyes. Um, we found, um, first to answer your first question, yes, people were looking for reading material in part because um, uh, some of the online places, they were too busy, they couldn't send out books, the libraries were closed, people needed books, and, um, and we have an online ability, to, we can order online and we were shipping out and all that. But um, books of all sorts, of course, the whole cooking thing and, and just good reading, some comfort food, I call it, those books that just make you feel, ah, oh, you know, the world's a lot right now. I can go away and escape in a book. However, right about the same time that COVID hit, of course, we as a whole nation have so much to discuss um, you and I were talking a little bit. It's, it, it, it's like recently a Band-Aid has been really ripped off and exposed some things that some of us don't maybe want to know about or don't know about and about racial relations. And um, so many of our customers have wanted to learn more. They want to know um, what are the issues? What is the history of our racial you know, relations? And I was, I was so, it made me so happy to see um, the interest in the books. Um, so, um, so yeah, definitely, definitely saw that. Um, I don't know if I, at the time I, we were talking earlier, yeah. it was right before COVID hit, we had our American Booksellers Association meeting down in Baltimore. And I've always, I talked about this giving community of, of literary community, and, and this is very much a giving group. One of the big themes, and this was February, right before COVID, um, was diversity in literature, diversity in book selling, uh, diversity in, well, just the whole written, the world of the written word. And um, one of the sessions that I attended was so powerful. There were four uh, booksellers or publishers from the 60s who started their stores or their businesses as a way of, um, because they knew that words have power. They were black booksellers and they started bookstores because they knew in the long run that words can make a difference. They were founding members of um, SNCC and the Black Panthers and very, very active people. Uh, one of them was Paul Coates, who was the father of ta Coates. He is a publisher. Um, it's the Black Classic Press, I believe it is, that he has. And to preserve important works by Black authors and to reprint them. And I was so impressed by this discussion of people who value words. Um, can I tell that little story? I, I just, I was astounded. I, I, I printed it out afterwards. Um, uh, the moderator of this panel has done a lot of work on these, this move bookseller movement. 
And at one point in November of 1968, which was a very traumatic year in the United States, J. Edgar Hoover wrote a memo and I'll read part of it. He said, the Bureau has noted an increase in the establishment of black extremist bookstores, which represent propaganda outlets, outlets for revolutionary and hate publications and cultural centers for extremism. Each office should locate and identify black extreme, uh, extremist and or African type bookstores in its territory throughout the United States and open separate discrete in investigations on each to determine if it is an extreme, if it is in street, extremist in nature. He goes on to say the investigation should determine the identities of the owners, whether it is a front for any group or foreign interest, whether individuals affiliated with the store engage in extremist activities, the number, type, and source of books, the clientele, and whether it's used as a headquarters or meeting place. Isn't that amazing. Even Edgar Hoover realized the power of words in his own wrong way. Sure. But, um, so I just, I felt like I was in the presence of some pretty incredible people who could, who had a lot of bravery in what they were doing and a lot of passion in looking for racial justice and, and spreading the word. And you know, and it's no less different for women, right? Um, that's, that's powerful what you're saying, but I did a little research on women in literature and there were times when women were shut down when they you know, said certain things. Think of the book, Little Women and the character Joe when she wanted to be a writer and they just encouraged her to, okay, your book's gonna end with the woman gets married, right? You know. <laughs> they wanted to see, you know, they wanted to see that part of her. And, and there were some women who wrote things that were considered controversial and shut down. So I'm just going to take this moment and read a poem that I wrote. Um, and, you know, some years ago, I went to a, a life coach and she asked me what was my, um, you know, vision for my life or whatever my, you know, and I said to um, inspire using the written, spoken, and, and poetic word of God. So I, I write poetry, right? As most of you know, um, not brave enough to publish any poetry, um, but I write poetry and I like it. So this is called The Winds of Change. Um, the winds of change are blowing. The chants of equity echo across the nation, calling us to our higher selves. Books about black history line the shelves. No more hidden figures. The veil has been lifted. Black history is American history. Without it, a song devoid of rhythm, a light that would not glow. A heartbeat stops. The cadence of oration is dry. A colorless landscape meets the sky. The shackles and chains that causes descendants of trade to bow their heads in shame knowing kings and queens did not die in vain. Our history is fluid. It has a beginning and has no end. In war, the first casualty is truth. The truth is we are living proof of resilience. One drop does not make us whole. To be seen as descendants of the, of the diaspora is our ultimate goal. We were not born here, we were brought here, fully equipped with love, intelligence, our God and innovation, without acceptance or invitation, and still we rise. The quests for our rights are not civil, met with resistance at every turn. When will they learn we are a peaceful people and still your anger burns? When will they learn that our history is their history? No longer hidden, no need for revision. These truths keep marching on. Thank you. Thank for you. That moment. Thank you. Yeah, so.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I want to go back to Becky for a moment. You know, I said we weren't born here. We were brought here, right? Um, without invitation, right? Or acceptance. And I know that some of your immigrants, um, you know, must feel the same way they come here. Um, people have their own homelands and they want to be, like we talked earlier, you know, they want to be home, but they're here and they, they want to make life and everyone um, wants the best for their families. So I just want you to talk about some of your experiences um, on the, you do a lot of public speaking on this. And right now in this, in the winds of social change, you know, your message is, is much needed out there. Well, and I really think it's the message of the people too. The people. I mean, you yeah. know, I, 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 I hear the words that you all have been talking about in terms of the strength of, where it's the strength of stories and the things Yolanda has talked about and the power of stories. And I'm very impressed with that, in, especially in this last book that was, that was all dedicated to not only my portraits of the people, but also of their, of their stories of leaving their home country, which of course nobody really wants to do. I mean, they, they want to stay where they're comfortable and where their friends are and all their social connections and what they're familiar with. But, you know, so many people have come here because of the terrible situations in their own home. And so then that whole process of coming and having to adjust to a no, new culture where maybe they didn't know the language, they didn't know the money and the currency, uh, they didn't know the school system or where the grocery store was. I mean, it's really starting at ground zero. And, and yet I see so much strength in these families and so much focus and especially focus for education. And I was mentioning to Marie earlier that I started a scholarship program for refugees to complete a four year um, college degree. And it's through the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. And there's more information on my website, but I think the key point is that the, the immigrant families uh, came here with a strong drive for a better future for their kids and for their families and their you know, future generations. And that a lot of them saw that education uh, was such an important part of that. But you know, the stories are so powerful because I've heard the saying, which uh, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, you can't hate a person once you've learned their story. And I think that's so important for us all to remember, to listen to people that may look different than we are, but you know, even though we have a lot of uh, different roots and different backgrounds, we all have the same dreams, to have a safe family, to have a future, to have healthy children and to be able to practice our traditions. So it's, you know, I've gained so much through this project. You know, I've learned so much about other people and other cultures, and it's been a real gift. Thank you, and thanks for being a gift to us. It's so beautiful, and we can't wait. I can't wait to get it. I love coffee table books and just love having things out for Chase to look at. At this time, I just want to thank our sponsors. Um, I just thank um, the Department of Social Department of Developmental Services, excuse me, um, for having the insight to want to create programs that, um, you know, have conversations about diversity, inclusion, and um, social justice. Um, and also the Kennedy Donovan Center. Um, they called on me back in July to put together some programs. And at the time, I really didn't know what um, this was going to look like. And I'm just so glad and, and so thankful to them for um, stepping up and, and, and providing this uh, platform so that I can bring together people from all over the country to have these conversations and take them. And now they're shown on um, different, um, let me see, community television um, stations and all the social media platforms and you know, people are just sharing them all over the place. So one other part of um, the storytelling process that we didn't get into, and I'm just going to put um, someone on the spot real quick. And if, if uh, you know, and 
rightly so, I think, is um, the filmmaking process, turning those stories, right? Taking that story from the, 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 the writing and the book process and turning it into a film. So my sister, Sheila, is on the call and I don't see my niece, Shelby. She's in um, grad school at UCLA and she is a graduate of Wake Forest um, University. Um, she created Wake Forest Television and she's, she was an honor student and she went on to UCLA and now she's in grad student. And Shelby was a panelist on our last show called Young To Be Young, Gifted and Black. And she's a powerful young lady and she is in the process of writing, a, writing and producing a film, directing a film. And um, it's, it is to bring representation, I think, of, of, of stories that she didn't see growing up. I think there's a quote by Mae Jameson that she uses, right? That, um, Sheila, uh, can you unmute yourself and help me with this? Oh, the quote okay. is never be limited by your, by others limited imagination. In fact, I did put um, Shelby's uh, Indiegogo link in the chat. She has three days, including today to get to $15,000 for film financing. And uh, she is about $3,500 away. So I would urge all of you to um, bring your story to life by bringing her story to life. And that is by posting her link and encouraging folks in these last few days to give whatever they can and to share her link and to get her to her $15,000 goal. But I am honored to be here today to hear all of your stories and Yolanda's methodology for teaching and um, you know the perspectives, the different perspectives, um, your trials and tribulations. And thank you, Marie, for your poem. Thank you. You know, um, we're better together than we are apart. We're better when we can see the the, the string that connects us all, right? Um, from, the, from the creative process of thinking, I want to write a book all the way through the publishing process to um, that creative process, to, right to the bookstore where we get that book into people's hands, right? That's what this show is about today, right? And to, to you, our view, viewers, the readers, right? So I encourage you today to take a look at some of these books if you desire, but also to encourage um, others to read. Because I think what's lacking in our culture and our society from what I see is, is reading, like just the fundamentals that people lack information, right? Basic information, a lot of things were left out of history, right? not only black history, but other people's history, other, other things that people, it's people so readily Google little things or they're on social media and they take these things as fact, but people aren't really sitting down and reading books and stories that will help them to flush out ideas and thoughts. So I'd like to see more of that and how maybe Vicki, we can go to your website and be encouraged to join some of your book clubs or come to your book signings. We can go to Ayanna's book signing. We can go on to um, Yolanda's site on Facebook and join her very vibrant coaching sessions. They're really, really good. And, um, and also, you know, connect with Deborah to see the kind of motivation that it takes to to write a book um, and to write a second book, you know. And Becky, um, you know, just follow you as you are out there um, teaching, you know, and, and telling the stories of other people that um, inspires other people to want to know more and kind of lay down those, you know, that's what the show's really about, right? inclusion right when we get to know others well when we get to have the conversations whether it's with people with of different races cultures abilities we open up a we open our our world a little bigger yeah. and i'm just so pleased to be a part of a part of this 
Does anyone want to say something? You guys are quiet out there. Marie, you usually have something to say. Hi, right. Marie. This uh -huh. is uh, Deborah Mitchell. Hi, Deborah. Uh, Hi. I, wrote, I wrote the book, Popping Beans, children's book, and I have the publisher, Yolanda Lewis, on. Woo. All right. There's the roof. <laughs> there's the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's the book, and I just wanted to mention how you said we're better together than we are apart, because this um, book was truly a family affair, from the publisher being my cousin and the illustrator being her mom, Karen Penn, and um, the writer, myself, and even your son, who added a piece of the book, which was the uh, culinary piece and the coloring book in the back. So I just wanted to share that and say I'm, I'm glad to be here. Awesome. And I think your information is down in the, um, in the chats as well. So if you guys are looking for a great children's book that is um, family based, it's about the traditions of some of the black, you know, family cooking traditions. And she has a series. She's in the process of publishing her second book. Um, you can look at that. Let me see. We will be hosting Sadiqa Johnson to talk about her book, Yellow Wife. I, I want to, yeah. I, oh, great. I want to see that. Can you tell us a little bit about Yellow Wife, please? I'd be happy to. It's the story of uh, a Black woman in eight, about 1850. She um, is fairly protected in the household she's in, but she ends up in a really bad and desperate situation. Um, in a really horrible uh, slave market in Virginia. And uh, it's, it's her story and it's a beautiful, beautifully written novel. We're very excited to be able to host Sadiqa for that. But I, I also wanted to say, Marie, what you've said is so powerful too. And, and I think that we're all learning so much right now. I've seen an, an incredible increase in diversity in the books that are being offered now. I think publishers have fin finally listened, booksellers have finally listened, and we're seeing, um, you know, we're realizing that maybe some people weren't reading because they weren't seeing themselves and their lives in the books that were being offered. Mm -hmm. And now that's not as much the case, and, and it's really heartening. I love the fact that um, books with diverse characters, it isn't all about the race, like for children. Um, of course, I'm in bookstore, so I've, I've brought a few stories and things, but it's, it's just stories like Everywhere Babies and what children are seeing are faces that look different from them, and but also the same. Mm -hmm. um, you know, here's monsters in the bath. I mean, and, and uh, so children, uh, like when I grew up, we did not see diverse spaces in the literature that we read. Mm. I'm very excited about, we're talking a lot more about race and this is a brand new book for preschoolers. It's called Our Skin, A First Conversation About Race, um, which I just got a chance to look at. And it's fabulous, um, open and honest. And I have a cat rubbing my screen. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's there's people people that's great. And, and we have so many local people who are, <laughs> <laughs> Here are people that are writing about diversity and this is my bed by the wow. mark of sally mayfor um so it's just children it's children's stories and here's twins that just came out a graphic novel i mean there's so many but there are more choices now and people yeah. i think relate to that they can see themselves they can see their stories and um the children um there's a group from the new england booksellers um we have a children's advisory committee. Uh, I have to give a shout out to Sarah Hines at a cousin's bookstore in Falmouth. They've developed a program called Windows and Doors, where mm -hmm. we look at books as through as windows so we can see a window into somebody else's life. Mm -hmm. And uh, and door, oh dear, now I'm getting it all mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great when it opens a, a door, windows right? It's not windows and doors. I'm sorry. That's why I couldn't do it. Or you see a mirror where you can see yourself and relate to the character. And um, they're having an effect. And publishers are listening to the demand that, that readers have and booksellers have. And um, so it is people like you that these get these conversations going, Marie. Yes. Thank you for spreading the word. That's awesome. Right. And do you have any stand-up poetry readings at all at your, at your shop? 
we are having some events for a poet or at least one we're, we're, we're putting everything together, but we've had um, poetry readings. We'll do, we're doing everything virtually now. So it opens okay. up to people from all around the world. And um, so um, you can look on our website if you'd like or sign okay. up for our newsletter. Okay. And um, yes, there will be, we're, and there'll be some more coming up. We have another gift of, of this period is that we have some marvelous young people that have joined us and two of them are incredible poetry readers and they're working with us on um, some poetry events for the coming year. I'm so excited about that. So Marie, perhaps we'll hear you read your story, your poems. Oh, great. So in two <laughs> weeks, guys, I hope that you will join us for our next in the series. It's going to be women who make a difference in business. So please join us um, on is this March? Yeah, March 31st, right? Wednesday at four o'clock. This has been such a wonderful conversation. And um, yes, Ayana, you surely can say um, Hi. yes. No, I just wanted to let people know that are watching that never thought they could write a book. They can totally, Yolanda knows this. You could totally write a book. Anyone who's written, like it's, um, it feels daunting but it's, if you have like inspiration and something you wanna say or share to the world, I just wanna let people know that it's totally possible and just you know ask for help and get support, same like you would anything else. And um, just, cause people, the, the things we're saying about sharing stories um, is that like, that's sort of how people get in recovery and how they heal, <clears throat> sorry, is by hearing how other people made it out so how people really change their life in, in a way to know that, so right, so that you know that it's possible. Mm -hmm. So I just want to encourage everyone out there who is thinking about it, who are like, oh my God, I can't write a book. You know, it's, I'd love to write, but I didn't really think I was going to be writing a book at some point in time, but um, here I am. Um, and 90% and of that was just believing that it was possible. So, you know, it's, just wanted to say that to, and thanks for having me and, and I really enjoyed hearing everyone panel and we'll love to connect and with you. Yolanda did you hold up Omenera? No I didn't and I, I wanted to uh, if you don't mind I'll jump in and, and do that but I also want to echo Ayana's comments in that with you doing whatever you know with you sharing your story right so I never thought I'd write anything for children a lot of my books I have to do with self-development for women and mothers etc but this book I decided to do as a part of my personal project with the song, Ominita, about freedom. I reached a milestone birth and I want to enter in this next phase of my life free from fear, from feeling like I can't, from feeling like I'm not enough to do this, or maybe I'm too much because I'm pretty animated. Uh, whatever it is, I wanted to get that out. And so I decided to do children, a children's book because I wanted to inspire children to not only feel free enough to do whatever, that's what it talks about, them being able to do whatever, but also feel free enough to express that do whatever. Um, and so that's why the book goes with the song and, and it's just a fun project that, that has happened. I've seen so many little girls, they've sent their mothers has sent me pictures of them with the book, smiling in ways that you can't fake, like their mother didn't say smile for the camera and they were like, eh. they really were happy and excited from what they got from the book. Other little girls, they named the character. They were excited to say that she looked like me or in some way was just like me of all colors um, of children. So, and of all ages, young girls, but of all, you know, within the age bracket, this book is written for under seven, but 12 year olds have read it. 11 year olds have loved it um, and under. So I share this not to not to just boost myself, but to really echo what Ayana was saying in that you really, there's no limit on what you can do with the quote um, that Shelby is, you know, basing her project off of with the bringing the stories to film. Don't limit your yourself by age or anything, by age, by other people, what they think or what they heard about you or what they think you should be doing by this time in your life. None of that get out there and share what you have to share with the world because someone, some little girl, some little boy, some person is waiting. They're waiting for it. That's so wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. Does anyone else have anything to say? Cause we're gonna close this out with Omenera, the song. Mm -hmm. Yes. Marie? 
I do. I, I, I'm going to try to keep it brief, but I would say to, I'm sorry, Kate, at the Pitkin bookstore, I've forgotten your first name. Vicki. Vicki. Um, there's, there's something really big happening in Sandwich right now. And, and I didn't know that because I, I have the Inclusion and Diversity Committee in um, Mashpee. And there, you know, your school committee has always, has just come up with a, a whole a new diversity committee that they've started. And now there's a group in Sandwich that want to start a, a, a group, a, a, you know, an organization right in Sandwich. So you're there. <laughs> I'm just letting you know <laughs> that there's a movement going on. <laughs> the winds are change and blowing. Things are happening. Things are happening. And, then, happening. and yeah. then I finally, I do have to say to Becky um, in New Hampshire, I want to meet you for lunch. <laughs> I, I am in, on Cape Cod, but my children, I was in Derry, New Hampshire at a time when in 1980s, when all of a sudden this white Anglo-Saxon Protestant class a group of people in Derry, New Hampshire culture were invaded by all kinds of different people from different worlds and different colors. And it was quite a traumatic period. And so she'll know because I was at Pinkerton Academy, which is the big high school there. And uh, my children, I have two grandchildren being brought up in New Hampshire. So I'm really connected to New Hampshire. But and 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 I I am a little bit concerned because uh, my oldest grandson is in, at UNH and it is not diverse at all. So <laughs> I'm hoping that Becky's work will, will maybe she'll have something to say about that. But uh, I'm going to email her anyway. I'm going to go again on his site and, and we can have a, a really good chat. <laughs> I, I'd love to chat with you, Marie, and I'll put my email in the, in the chat. Awesome. So thank, thank you. you. And we, yeah. the, New Hampshire yeah. still needs to do a lot more. It does. And and uh, my son and I, my family there is in Bedford, New Hampshire. So I'm not far from Concord, Becky. Good. <laughs> thank you. So I'm going to close this out. I want to thank, thank, thank our panelists. Um, Vicki uh, to come books shop and to Becky Field in her wonderful work to Yolanda Lewis and to Ayanna Parent and to uh, Deborah O'Brien. And if you want to follow up with any of these amazing women, their information will be um, in the chats. We have a recording and also you can contact me if you you know, just send me an email and I can get things to you. Um, yes, I would love to come to New Hampshire also, Becky. And um, I know I'm gonna be on a event with you in April. So I'm glad about that. Um, yes, Vicki, you're welcome. This has been an amazing pleasure. So we're just gonna close this out with um, Omenera. Omenera. And Can you imagine? Look at this. Wow. Oh. <laughs> we need some sound. Hold on, let me just check. <sighs> Hold on. On the other side of fear is freedom, independence, and liberty. Ominida.
Okay, you guys know what that means, right? That means you got to get a, a music video to go with your books. 